And um, yeah, so Daniel is a brilliant game designer, um, someone who I think first came to prominence uh, as um, one of uh, a group of uh, game developers who were really interested in exploring the expressive power of, of games. So there was a kind of a art games movement uh, with, with Daniel and, and people like uh, Jonathan Blow and uh, Jason Rohr and Rod Humble um, who were really interested in figuring out whether games could fulfill this promise of being a cultural form that does the same kind of expressive and emotional and thematic work that film does, that literature does, that music does, but in its own way, not through the words and not through just the pictures and not through the music, um, but through the experience itself, through, through the game mechanics. And um, that's something that, uh, you know, in, in works like Today I Die and the, and the award-winning storyteller, um, Daniel was a, kind of a pioneer in, in exploring these, these ideas. Um, he has continued to be a, a, a game designer and developer. Um, his most recent work, uh, Fidel, I think is uh, just a, a brilliant object lesson in game design. Um, I encourage all of you to check it out. It's um, such a, a, a well-designed game. Uh, every corner of it is created with, with care and attention, and it's just kind of, it's, it's like a luxury good almost. Maybe that's not the way you like to think of it, but um, it just has this sense of, um, of kind of deep care and attention to every detail of its execution. I really think that um, it's a game that, that rewards uh, a, a kind of um, close attention and, and careful play. Uh, it's a beautiful game and I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, Daniel is also um, the, uh, one of the co-organizers of the, the, the sort of one guaranteed can't miss session at the Game Developers Conference every year, the Experimental Gameplay Workshop. Um, which is uh, something that is um, just an expression of, of Daniel's interest in supporting uh, game design as an ongoing uh, project in figuring out uh, what games are and what they can be. Um, he's also been uh, a personal inspiration to me, someone who has um, pushed me to, to think about my own practice and, um, and develop my skills as a, as a kind of independent coder. So maybe the, the, one of the main reasons that I was ever able to kind of sit down and make a game as a, just one person working by myself and doing all the coding uh, was because of uh, Daniel <laughs> kind of haranguing me <laughs> to figure out how to do that. And um, so I'm really happy that he did it. Um, and uh, really happy to have him here uh, tonight to talk about his ideas and his work and his process. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Ben Mergi. All right. All right. Um, oh, yes. They gave me just one instruction and I forgot about it. Uh, he sent. There. Switch again. Of course, it will happen. Sorry. No problem. 
Well, I can start talking. How, how many of you have played Fidel? All right. Now, how many of you have not played Fidel? Okay, because of you guys, I'll have to explain the game. Yes. So, um, as you can see, it says design postmortem there. Before I start, I want to say that I find, you know, every, every talk that says postmortem in it, I already know beforehand it's going to be bullshit. <laughs> Most talks about postmortems are about people drawing the wrong conclusions about what happened to their project, right? We failed because we didn't use enough green. We uh, succeeded because we fought to the end, and all sorts of conclusions that are wrong, right? So those talks are usually not very good. But this, in particular, is the kind of talk that I, I wish I could see more, and everybody, uh, every time somebody does this, I'm very happy about it, which is do a sort of design postmortem, in which I think about the choices we made on design, uh, where uh, we made the right choices, and how we uh, came to those choices, uh, which choices we screwed up, and which ones we don't know yet, right? So this is going to be a, a bit of uh, uh, picking apart some of the things that uh, make Fidel work or not work. So let's start by uh, showing all the people who haven't tried the game what it's about. So as you can see, there's a dog there. That's Fidel. Okay, as he walks around. Uh, he leaves a leash behind. And one of the things that happened in this game is that I cannot go over the leash, which means that I can only step on each cell only once. Okay? This is very important. Uh, once I start a game, it's a, it's a roguelike kind of thing, kind of game, right? Where there's, there's monsters. When I, when I kill monsters, you can see there's, a, uh, there's an XP bar down there that gets filled up as I kill monsters. If I fill it all up, I level up and get new things to keep uh, uh, working through the game. But there are a, bit, uh, a few particularities to Fidel. One is that you cannot step over the leash, which, which means that you need to be uh, tactic about which monsters you're going to get and how, and what's going to be the shape of your path to maximize the amount of monsters you can kill. And also, if you walk back the leash, you're actually rewinding which means that you can rewind to the beginning of the level of Fidel to try to find a better, so better solution and maybe uh, uh, preventing yourself from getting stuck you know, in some corner of the level. Um, there's uh, many things to this game. We're going to see a few of them. Uh, one of the other particularities of this game uh, that belongs to the roguelike category, roguelike crawl crawler category, is that if you die, this ghost shows up, right? So I can rewind, but once I die twice, I get this ghost that is coming right uh, uh, to, to, to chase me. And if he reaches me, I die for good, right? This is important because uh, I'm going to talk about this in a second, 
This is important to design because it brought me no end of pain. As you can see, the levels change on each run. We're going to talk a bit uh, about that as well. But I, I, wanted just, I just wanted you guys to have a sense for what the game is about. So when I, when I started Fidel, um, I chose some principles that would guide the design of the game. Every time, every time we start a new game, start working on a new project, we adopt principles that are going to be the guide that we have to make choices. We cannot avoid this step. We always make choices of principles. We always choose principles, whether we are aware of them or not. They're always there. Maybe you just borrow those principles from another game, but you always have principles. Uh, in, in my experience, like the really expert game designers are often aware of these principles. They know what the principles are. Uh, so that tends to make for tighter and better guided designs when that happens, in my opinion. So I chose some principles, uh, um, fully aware of them for this game. And I chose one principle that I was not aware of and it brought me a lot of pain. And we'll see about that later. One of the principles I chose for this game, and I was adamant about this one, is I would have hardcore respect for my player's time and intelligence. Which means, which ended up meaning that I had to do some things the hard way. One of the things I decided to get rid of are didactic tutorials. At this point, I would say like pedagogical or didactic, didactic tutorials. Uh, I despise them. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> then another, th another choice I made was I would not have upgrades, right? Like, wh why, did, why, why didn't I include a didactic tutorial in the game? It's because I, I want to respect my player's intelligence. Also for upgrades, you know, upgrades to things that you play again and again, but you get a new things that you can use next run and it keeps you running and all the stuff. I chose to get rid of, those, of that as well. And grinding, you know, you need to do the same thing over and over again. You can just sleepwalk through it. And another rule that was interesting was the rule of the 80%. That's another principle I adopted for this game, which pretty much means this thing. I only solve 80% of the problems in the game and I leave the other 20 unsolved. And I only solve problems to 80%. So no solution is going to be perfect. The game is 80% balanced, 80% elegant, 80% polished and only 80% perfectible from the player's point of view. So this rule of the 80% is all over a game. Now, where, why, did I, why did I choose this principle? This is a weird principle, right? Who, who does that? I mean, you want to have 100%. Why would you choose only 80%? Why, why would you settle, right? And the answer is that there's a history to Fidel. And the truth is, I've been working on this idea around Fidel for almost four years. So you saw that, that was a small game. Fidel is a small game. But I've been working around it for four years. So it all started when I made a game called Ernesto RPG. And it's the, uh, you know, the ugly pixel thing on the, on the upper left. And when I started this game, I, I, I thought it was a good idea. It's the same principle, you just walk around, you know, collecting XP and stuff. But I was, I sort of radicalized into trying to solve things 100%. And one thing that happened is that as I evolved, you know, trying to get rid of the uh, non-satisfactory solutions and, and the non-perfect solutions and the half solutions, I tried to, you know, have 100% tight control over the game. I started losing all the roguelike aspects. You can see them just starting, the game starting to shed them away. I mean, the UI starts to get simpler. There are less monsters, the maps are smaller. I, I ended up with the thing on the lower right, which was a puzzle game. That's a pure puzzle game, not a roguelike. Right? And this happened because if you want things to be 100%, uh, you tend to evolve into, uh, you know, this very minima minimalistic, uh, perfectable puzzles with only one solution. So I, I chased, I chased that, that path and it got me there into a pure puzzle game. So at, at this point, uh, uh, somebody offered me money to make a spin-off of this game that was actually a roguelike. 
So I decided to take it, and that's how Fidel was born. But when I started Fidel, I said, I don't want to fall into the same pit as I did before, so I'm going to assume that the game is not going to be perfect, the solutions are not going to be perfectable, and uh, um, so I'm going to, so I made up this 80% rule. Now let's go into design things. The problem number one that I dealt with this game is the ghost. The ghost actually, uh, the way it works is that there's a timer with the ghost. So for each level you get, say, three minutes, right? Once those three minutes are over, the ghost pops up and just chases you around. If you die in the middle of the level, what happens is the ghost is accelerated. I mean, you get, you get uh, a, pay, a time penalty for dying, which makes the ghost you know, show up uh, faster. And if he gets you, you lose the whole run for good. I mean, to say that people were not happy about this would be an understatement. You're, you're, when you start a game, you're you know, trying to figure out how things work, and suddenly this ghost comes up, and you don't know what it is, and suddenly you're dead. And then you try again, and you, know, you screw up again, and you die again. People were not really very receptive to the ghost, which made me suffer quite a bit, because the ghost, the reason why the ghost is there is not about challenge, or it's about uh, making the game harder, artificially shorter or longer, or whatever. The ghost is actually a tutorial. And for this, uh, this is, this is, um, these are ideas I got in my head, that this is how uh, the game should work. The reason why I have a, there's a timer in this game is that when you start the levels, there's a bunch of stuff that you don't know how anything works. And there is a, an, op uh, an optimal solution to the levels, there is. Given the situation you're in on each level, there is an optimal solution. It's just very, it's very hard to figure it out. And if you are not familiar with the game, it's not enjoyable to find it. Because you don't really know how things work yet. So uh, you're better off to, you know, just moving on and uh, seeing what else is in the game. So you can and, and do this again and again until you start picking up how the small things work. And then you can start optimizing the individual levels. So, in order to do this, there is a timer. There is no reason why I included a timer. The, the, ghost, the ghost showing up eventually into the level was meant to, to tell you, do not stay for long. You don't, you don't want to uh, linger. You want to move on because if you are triggering the timer, you're not good enough at this game yet to, uh, um, to linger. It's better to move on and see what else is there. So that was my rationality at the moment. I, 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 I came to this conclusion and I stood by it, stubbornly stood by it for uh, about two years. And then recently I, I, I changed my mind, but I'll talk about it later. And the other one is that dying prevents brute forcing. I mean, if, if, if dying was, didn't have a penalty, you could you know, just be confused and just bump into things and, 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 and feel and feel terrible, and you don't understand how things work, but just, you just move back and forth, and the fact that they kill you if you make you know, certain kind of mistakes over and over again is to tell you, slow down, you need to think in this game. It's not meant to you know, try to rush your way. It's, 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 it's a game made, uh, made out to think. Uh, the reason why I, I am so sure that these two things were true is because when you get good at Fidel, the ghost is not a problem. You never hit the timer, and you ne almost never die. So for good player, the ghost is not a problem. It's meant to you know, get new players to uh, play the game the right way. But of course, it, draw, it has drawn, as you can see, it has drawn a lot of uh, uh, you know, bad, bad, bad feelings. Now, having no upgrades and not gra no grinding is a design challenge. But as, I rem as you remember, I chose the principle of re respecting my player's time. Uh, so what I did was, you know, just hope that the inherent mechanic of finding the optimal way in a level was good enough. So I took some steps to do that. First of all, I decided that the game would be, the game would be snappy. I'm going to have the game open now. Uh, 
by snappy means you know there's no walking animations that you have to wait on. You can just you know just I can just rush through the, through the game without uh, any. I'm not going to get killed by my own ghost, just in case you were hoping. Um, and you know uh, the, the, this game, which is about you know tracing a path through a, through a maze through a through a grid. Uh, in order to make that the topology of doing that more interesting, uh, we came up with the idea of having more monsters than you know just a regular small spiders, right? Uh, so I, I I I I just vomited a few monsters here, as you can see what they are about. And these these monsters that are not spiders are special monsters, and they have something about them. Uh, they all have a weakness to them that you can exploit, and they are meant to. We tried many many monsters ideas for this game. And we settled for the ones that we felt offered a different take on finding an optimal path to the game. For example, uh, the, the tortoise here, as you can see, it moves its heads towards you. If, I, if you hit them, these, these special monsters are right the wrong way, you lose two hearts and you don't get any XP out of them. I mean, you can go through them, but you pay a pretty big penalty for doing so. But uh, they all have a weakness. In this, in this particular case, you can grab turtles uh, through the tail, and then you get an XP bonus, and uh, you don't lose any health at all. And all these special monsters have their own thing. Like the mushroom here, if you hit them, it poisons you, which reduces your uh, health for this level. Or you can move around and come back later when it has you know, been exhausted. And now it's harmless, it gives a lot of XP. The reason why these, these two monsters, the, the, the way they work, is that the turtle is the tortoise, sorry. The tortoise uh, is meant to have you have to approach this tile from a specific direction, right? That's a constraint that you have to deal with when moving around the level. The mushroom helps, uh, needs you to visit the mushroom, to get close by uh, the mushroom, and then come back later. So it needs you to move into the close to the monster, go away, and then come back. In the case of the plant, uh, it, it has you so you have to need to surround it. You kill all the roots, and then it dries out, and you can just kill it. It means you you always need to go around it from one way or the other, but you need to go around it. So it means going around the tile. This monster here is sleeping. So if he, uh, if I hit him when he's sleeping, I get the bonus. But if I kill something right next to it, it wakes up and I cannot move. So this, this tile in particular uh, needs you to approach it uh, from free, free cell, free neighboring tiles. The Nosferatu here uh, is, is a special thing. What it does is if you, if you hit it, it, won't, it will never kill you, but it will take all your health away. So what you do here is you, you get down to zero hearts and then it goes to sleep because you have no blood and then you can kill. This means that these tiles need to be approached uh, with uh, a certain state of, of health. Well, this one here is, is a variant of the regular tortoise. It just, when you move around it, it keeps looking at you, so you never get the tail. So you need to really uh, sneak around it to kill it. And this one is the egg, which uh, if you kill it right on, it heals you, but if you wait for a bit, um, it turns you into a snake that points you, but gives you a lot of XP if you want to take that hit. And here, uh, sometimes there's a chest, chest of gold that you use to uh, buy a bomb and stuff like that that helps you clear the levels. Uh, but this one is not a regular chest, it's a mimic. And there's a mechanic in Fidel that is hidden in plain sight. Every, every, uh, sometimes when you die, let me see if I can trigger that particular hint. Uh, see, it says press control to bark. Now, if I press control, right, it seems it, it feels like a joke, right? It, it's it, it's a joke. <laughs> However, if you uh, restart a game and actually do press control, it does bark. And barking actually has an effect on many monsters. This is a hidden surprise uh, in the game, uh, and you can use it in very special cases. Like 
in the case of the tortoises, I can bark at them and they will turn towards me, which I can use to my advantage to, you know, stab them in, in the back. Uh, in the case of the mimic, I can just bark and it wakes up. See, so now I know it's a mimic, but also I can backstab it. See, he can see me. Um, you can, you know, bark at these guys, they wake up, but you probably don't want to do that. Um, okay, th now there's these small spiders that don't take health away from you. So I wanted something special to be, uh, so, uh, there to be s special stuff for all the monsters. And in the case of the spiders, they're, they're just regular monsters. Uh, they don't have a weakness per se. But if you kill three monsters, including the spiders, on a row, you get a triple which gives you a small XP boost. And in this case, these red spiders turn around when you do a triple. So you can use that to uh, hit them. And then whenever you hit something new, they turn back on. So you need to do several triples in order to get them. Well, there's, there's more stuff in the game. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the game. Uh, here you get a boss, uh, the alien, uh, which shoots uh, death ray. Uh, and then there are more, there's these, these robots that you need to push, uh, you need to press the buttons in order to get them to turn off, but they also move the small towers and all these, these various things that are happening in the game are there to, to make the topology of just walking around enjoyable. So this was actually part of the effort of uh, uh, of making the core mechanic in enjoyable uh, without relying on upgrades on you know getting stronger over time. There are surprises for the observant. The bark is one of them, but there are many many things going on. Like if you maybe maybe you notice that uh, there's a there's a ball here, right? So you may not do anything with it, but if you figure out barking, you can bark at it, and you get a flashback story thing uh, where you see why you're there in the dungeons in the first place and you only get to see the see it if you find the ball otherwise you have no idea why you're there you're just eating monsters or whatever yeah right um but also there are more surprises here see the ball is here now the ball always you know goes away so you can't do anything but you if you are tactic about it you can actually trick the ball And now what happens is the ball is in the levels. And this is going to be important and I'll show you why in a, in a, in a sec. Well, I'll, I'll, show, I'll just show you right now. Look at this. So if you keep making progress in the, oh, there's a surprise I wanted to show you guys. Yes. Uh, I'm spoiling the game for everybody who hasn't played it. Sorry. Uh, in any case, you know, it's, it's a game about playing the thing more than, you know, revealing what's, what's there. Uh, you can see the dragon here. Uh, now we're getting deeper into the dungeons. This level is, is I love this level, people don't. <laughs> Look at this. So this is actually a bigger, like a huge level, a big, big level. And I enlarged the window, I thought that was cute. Uh, so in order to beat this, this level here, you need to uh, find out uh, how the different parts of the dragon work. Let me, let me do something. Let me, let me show you something. Once you get through this, you get to save grandma, although you will find that it was not enough. So now you're back into a bigger dungeon. But if you, uh, but if you um, do something here, uh, remember the ball? Well, what happens, some people will ask themselves, what happens if I chase the ball down, like through all the levels in the game? I'm going to skip forward. Uh, I mean, if I keep going, the ball is, I'm cheating, right? Uh, <laughs> 
if I keep I keep moving the ball is going to I, I keep keep dragging the ball which keep grabbing the ball which makes the game a bit harder because you need always needs needs need to get it oh, as well as you know killing monsters and stuff. But if you manage to get it to the last level, and the question is, now the ball is here, right? What do I do with this ball? And some people are not going to realize this, but one thing you can do is this. <laughs> Not only that, but you also get, you will also get by doing this, you also change this a bit of the game. See the ghost? <laughs> now, you get ghost grandma. Until you rescue her again, and then you go. Well, so everything you've seen so far is one of the surprises we put into the game, and almost, almost nobody saw it. <laughs> Which is fine. I mean, those who did found a weird corner of the game. Uh, and also, uh, something I wanted to uh, make enjoyable the, about the core mechanic of the game is that the progress is skill-based. I, 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 I could beat Fidel in 15 minutes, or maybe even less, myself. You know, once you be a good player, you can just you can you can just speed run all of it. Uh, so it's about the progress in the game is about learning to play the game better. And once you do, it's just pretty simple to get to the end. Um, let's keep going. Uh, well. Um, I'm going to go come back to this every now and then, but you know, a lot of people complain about the tutorial of the game and not having a tutorial and stuff. Uh, but as 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 it often happens, one thing that I've learned as a game designer is that uh, whenever there's a problem or people are complaining about a problem or, or seeing people have problems with some stuff, uh, uh, these are mostly complaints, Steam complaints about uh, not be, not there being a tutorial and stuff. Sorry about the size of the font. Uh, is that whenever you have a problem, there's a root cause. There is a problem, there is a root cause. And the root cause is often not obvious. And you end up you know, trying to solve the wrong problem until you figure out what's really happening. So one thing that I was, I thought about this uh, quite a bit and I saw people play, and my conclusion was that people complaining about there not being a tutorial, it's not as much that they, they needed a didactic tutorial telling them, telling them what to do, but it was a ghost. The ghost was killing them, and they were getting frustrate, frustrated at it. Uh, so they were not learning. They felt that the game was punishing them for trying stuff into the game, which is a legit thing to think. Uh, as I said before, I despised didactic tutorials, which meant I wouldn't give no instructions, no pats in the back, and no talking. That meant, you know, not, not, not putting text into the game. I sort of had a bit of text. Uh, when, whenever you die, you get uh, this hint, which... Uh, by the way, uh, well, this is this is not the most interesting one. Let me see if I can find. Uh, see those hints? Those hints are useless. Mostly is what I realized. You know, when people tell you that people won't read, it's true. Like, it's always true. <laughs> um, so I wish that this is one of the choices I, would, I wish I made differently. Uh, but the thing is, I didn't, want you to, I didn't want to tell you what to do. Oh, now you need to, you are Fidel. You need to uh, trace this path through level, and you need to optimize for XP. Kill the spider. Good job, you kill the spider. Right? I didn't want any of that. Because I want to respect my players' intelligence. So one of the things I did was implement the level zero, what I call level zero, uh, tutorial. Let me. Um, uh, ah, not doing it again. See how I get these things? I haven't even even started to play the game, and I get these levels. These levels are meant there, are, me are meant to be small sandboxes where you can experiment with some of the monsters. Many people just ignore it as you know some oddity and stuff. But people who realize that they can use. 
uh, this level, uh, you, can, you can figure out how, to, um, how things work without you know, being in the middle of the level. For example, here, you can only get through these by using the bomb, otherwise you won't get to the other side. Here you learn about the different chests. Uh, here you learn about the mushroom. You need to trace the longest path, path in order to get it. Here you can learn about triples, right? Uh, here you can learn, oh, something you can do about barking is killing these small spiders, so. Uh, so you get, I mean, you get these levels, there are many more, but I haven't logged them yet. Let me, let me see if I can find the rest of them. So here you get Neg, you get Nostratus. So these, these are the levels designed to uh, teach you some mechanic of the game without forcing you to do it. At some point, I, I, as you can see on the screenshot on the right, I made it mandatory every now and then, I made it mandatory for you to actually solve these puzzles and it didn't work very well. You know, because some people didn't, couldn't figure out at the right time what, how the monster worked, so they suffered through this and ended up removing them. So if you want to do, use this as a tutorial, good. If you don't realize it, well, yeah, you have to play the game to uh, find out how things work. And I'm fine with that. Uh, well, also, to, uh, if Fidel has a bit of a sense of, of what your skill level is, and he, cha and he changes what level sign in the pool, on the left, there's only spiders, and it's usually the first level you get when you start playing the game. And once I, I, I notice that you can, uh, you're somewhat for proficient, I just throw, you, uh, throw everything I have at you. Of course, people still complain about this, right? What's root cause? The ghost. And this is, this is uh, one of the interesting things. Um, so as you can see in this uh, screenshot of the previous, the early Ernesto thing, uh, it was completely random. As you can see, it feels a bit like noise, right? Uh, it feels a, a lot like noise, which uh, this doesn't really feel like noise. This level doesn't really feel like it's, it's noise. It feels like, I mean, this, this one is. Uh, but there's, there's a pattern to these levels that makes them kind of readable, right? You can read this. You can read where things are. How does, how does that work? Uh, so in order to do that, there's, there's one thing that I really wanted, it was to play my own game. I, I, I spent several years making puzzle games, which has only, have only one solution, which means I cannot play them, right? I know solutions, so there's no point. Uh, so I wanted to play my own games for, you know, for change. So I did want procedural uh, level generation. But there's no way for a procedural algorithm to know if a level is enjoyable or not. Or not. You can give it some variables, but it has no idea how a human will react to, to uh, the levels it's, it's generating. Uh, so what I did was, you know, turn uh, adopt some rules. The first one was to avoid idiotic layouts. You know, avoid putting monsters in impossible positions. Like in this case. Uh, uh, I, there's a bunch of code here that says don't put a tortoise on a corner because then it's very hard to get it from the right direction. So avoid that. The second is that monsters band together. See, they're a group of three. They're grouping three. This makes things a lot more readable. This took me a long time to figure out. That sometimes, you know, when you have procedural generations, sometimes you want to maybe group things, try to group things together. So each one of these spiders uh, they know they belong to a group, uh, and they hate all the rest of the spiders and try to keep away from them. So the algorithm uh, makes this small group and, and try to keep the groups to, uh, the groups apart from each other, and that makes the levels a lot more readable. I'm, I mean, it's, I'm going to emphasize that these made the levels a lot better to read and play and, and to generate even. It was simpler to generate this, this way. Um, and the third solution, which is the most interesting one, is that I, I just included templates. Like a game called Spelunky uh, did this technique a long time ago, which is to say, okay, I have procedural generation, but I have handcrafted templates. So in the, in the case, uh, in the upper left, you get the gnome level. Uh, let me see if I can, you can summon the gnome level. Gnome, 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 gnome. 
So you see leaping. See, you can wake it up and just keep running away from you until you get it somewhere where you can kill it. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay. Park. So uh, this is a template of level, right? There's a, there's a new mini middle, there's a, there's a lever, there's, uh, there's spike traps, but, uh, and those are you know, put randomly into the level, uh, but there's a template governing how things work. The same uh, with the four turtles or the uh, towers in a cross uh, or the tutorial level. These are templates that the game uses to generate the levels, which, which makes the levels a lot more interesting to play but at the same time, the solution is always different and they require you to think things in a different way. Uh, okay, uh, another problem that we had is that, you know, you level up in this game. Let me show you what happens. All right, you get enough XP and you level up. One problem we, we were having is that people leveled up but they were, you know, busy trying to solve the level. So they never, never figured out uh, that they leveled up or that something changed in the game. This seems like a simple problem, but it was not, it was not simple to solve it. We spent a lot of time, uh, you know, trying to make it more, exa make more exaggerated animations and flashes and stuff happening and all that, and none of it worked. People just, you know, didn't realize that that happened. They were just too busy navigating monsters uh, to realize that uh, there was a level up thing. So we, what we ended up doing is that the first time you level up in this game, what we do is I take control away from you, which means I stop receiving input for a half a second. And believe me, people notice that. Uh, they noticed up, uh, down, uh, up to the point in which people were angry. Like, why are you, are you getting in the way of the game? And I was like, sorry, man. Uh, so this was an effective solution, especially because I only take it away for half a second. It's just, it's very, very brief. But people actually stop to think what's going on here and they realize that level up. So uh, that was a solution that I, I'm pretty proud of. Then another problem that we had is how many hearts I have. People uh, had problems remembering how many hearts left they have on each level, so they kept dying, right? They just ran around without realizing their, their state and just bump into things and die. And they were like, I don't, I don't know how many hearts I have. People kept complaining, I don't know how many hearts I have. And we, again, we tried with animations and stuff, and people just forgot, forgot about, about how many hearts they actually had. And we went through several stations. And this is, this is interesting, and I'm also happy about how we figured this out. Uh, first, we thought the problem was that people was, were not seeing the hearts because they were too far down uh, on the UI. And, and, and so we added animations, and, and it was not enough. And then we decided to add the hearts on the dog, and it was not enough. And, I was, and we were like, what, what, what do we do here? And then thinking about it a bit more, we ask ourselves a different question. Like, what is the root cause for this problem? What's really going on here? Is it that people are not seeing the hearts or is it something else? And then we realize that what you really want to know is not how many hearts you have, but can I bump into the mo these monsters without dying? That's pretty much all you care about. So uh, we decided to try to find a solution that answered that question. Um, and also serve other purposes as well. And, uh, you know, the floating hearts up here, first of all, we tried, you know, doing it that way. As you can see, there's four hearts, which is awkward and bad. And you, you know, that's, that's not interesting. It's not useful information. It doesn't, after the point in which you're, you're able to die, it doesn't matter how many hearts you have. So what we did was, okay, you start with the two hearts floating above you, so you have a reinforcement that there's something going on, and as you can see, those hearts are moving. And that's very important. We had to get those small hearts up there moving. They're, bump, they're, they're you know, they're bobbing around, right? If there were uh, a still, people would forget about them, don't see them. So what's really going on here is that people are not looking at Fidel or the UI. Nobody cares about that. People are looking where they are going. And once you go to that place and kill those monsters there, 
So I don't have any, I don't have time to look at the dog or, or the UI. So the small moving hearts are something you can, you, can, you can perceive with the peripheral vision. So you know if there's something moving on top of the dog, you're fine. And you're not glowing red, right? Uh, if the hearts are gone, you also realize, notice that, that you have no hearts on top of the dog. It's easier to perceive it with your vision without having to actually look at the dog. And then we decided that uh, we would allow another heart to be shown as a way to reinforce to people that by leveling, uh, leveling up, you get an extra heart. So you can see now we have three, because you're look, actually looking at the, at, the, at the dog, you realize there's three hearts. And then after that, once you level up beyond that, well, we also did it before, when you go beyond that, you just, this says you have a bunch of hearts, don't worry, right? <laughs> don't worry about it, just keep going, it's fine. Uh, Nothing in this game can kill you. Uh, uh, if you have at least two hearts, nothing in the game can kill you. So as long as you have two, you can bump into anything and you're not going to die. Uh, that's a rule we adopted to, you know, not play, not play the uh, racing arms race of get level up uh, so the monsters that hit you harder later, you can take them. We didn't want to do that. We, didn't wa we wanted to keep sim things very simple. So uh, after, you know, having two hearts, it's fine. You have a bunch of hearts, it's fine. And this worked pretty well. People stop complaining. I mean, those complaints actually disappear. So I'm pretty proud of this solution here. Uh, and the problem we had is that the game used to be just, uh, uh, you know, this, this wall up until a dragon and we rescued grandma. Uh, beat regular game. And then you get to the underworld. We call this the underworld. And we, what you get here is another set with new monsters and stuff. Uh, but with bigger levels, and you get to the actual ending of the game this time. Uh, but also, we added all these small things here. And what happened was that whenever people beat the game, regular game, they, you know, people ask, hey, I, I like the game, I enjoy getting to the end, but now I want to play more, right? So we're thinking, how do we make the game have more to give you, right? So we decided that instead of, you know, getting, you know, adding more worlds on more you know, bosses and stuff. We did a bit of that, but we decided to do orthogonal exploration, which means how can we do more with what we have instead of you know, keep adding new stuff? What happens if we just see how can you use the stuff we have in a novel way? And we did these this, uh, alternative worlds. Like in this one, it's a speed run. What happens is the ghost uh, shows up right away. So it's mostly if you're racing against a ghost from the get-go. Uh, if you get to the end, here's a, here's a homage in it. Uh, look. <laughs> and once you did this, there is no ghost in all of the game. Yes. I mean, you can die. I can die as many times as I want. It's fine. Like, there's no ghost. No problem. So the, the, the reason why this, I did this and I allow you to disconnect the ghost is that if you're able to raise the ghost and get enough XP to go through these levels, the ghost is not going to do anything for you. So you can get rid of it. Now, if you want it back, you can go back and release the trap and he's going to ch keep chasing you. But uh, the other thing that we did See, I mean, we didn't add any new mechanics per se. It was just the same mechanics that we have with, in a different light. These are the puzzle worlds. Uh, this is the puzzle world. All the levels here have an optimal solu solution and you have to find it, an optimal, which means you have to draw every single drop of XP that you have uh, in order to make progress. Uh, whereas the game had the 80% rule, this one has 100, needs you to do the 100% solution. Right? Uh, some of these levels can get really, really tricky. But again, we are, you know, we made it smaller. Maybe some of you may notice that these levels are actually kind of tiny, right? We had to keep, it, keep, keep uh, the problem contained because having to optimize a big level is actually quite, quite challenging. And we wanted this world to be fun to play. So again, we grabbed what we had and we did something different. Now, here we just did something crazy. This uh, monster is a centipede, and you need to kill all the parts in order to make progress. 
Oops. Wait. Now I'm going to embarrass myself for failing it. No. No. Now I take it as a personal challenge, sorry. This is. <sighs> now you see. Now you'll see. Yeah. So there's a bunch of levels in which you need to, uh, there's only one solution, there's no XP involved and stuff. You just find, you know, for these centipedes, uh, uh, how to kill them, and there's a timer at the end that if you beat it, uh, you get to, uh, uh, you get an achievement and stuff. The thing is, another thing that we did was have this called the daily challenge thing. There's a different level for each day, and you need to find an optimal solution in a big level. These sometimes can get really tricky to beat. Uh, I mean, it takes me a while sometimes to figure them out. Um, we did this so people who, you know, just get one in more, just, you just get a different level each day. It took some th something that's funny is that actually it takes my computer, which is a pretty fast computer, it takes, uh, easily it takes 15 minutes to figure out the optimal solution for these levels. And I optimized the crap out of, out of this algorithm. It takes about 10, 15 minutes for some of the tricky levels. As you can, as you can imagine, I, I'm not going to do that in your computer while you're playing the game, right? You're not going to wait 10 minutes so I can master up the level for you. So what I did was I left my computer for a weekend computing 600 levels. It was, it was actually a week. It just it's split in half, so I could use my computer. But I got 600 levels, and you know, with pre-calculated solution. Uh, so eventually, people will figure out that they're playing the same level. But yeah, I mean, 600. After you play 600 level, you're not going to remember the first one. <laughs> so you won't realize that you're only solving the same thing of levels. You keep playing it for years and whatever. Um, and something else that we did uh, was about this orthogonal design. Um, what is a surprise? I mean, oh, okay. Anyway, uh, if you solve a couple of these worlds, they unlock these things. These are hot dogs, by the way, and you get turned into a robot dog. And the way it works is that uh, I, I really wanted the, these alter, alternate robots to change how the game works. Uh, so in this case, this robot dog doesn't does not get any XP. It doesn't care about XP. So you're not going to level up by, by, by XP. You only level up by buying uh, uh, upgrades, by buying a level up. So uh, the game changes because now what's important in this game is for you to get all the coins and the chests that you, ca that you can because they uh, actually have a huge payoff for you. Um, so you want to grab all the coins that you can so you can get an extra heart, right? So you have to buy the extra card. And there are things that change, small things that change, like, uh, like Nosferatus don't do anything to this guy. They're always level. Let me see, let me see if I can find one. Uh, uh, probably not. We're going to be unlucky. Oh, I, I should have shown you that. Anyway, let me, let me, let me show you a second. Um, so uh, there's, there's small differences in the dog. And this one is a zombie Fidel, right? And this one, uh, what happens is it doesn't get any medicates. You cannot heal yourself. Um, the only way you can heal yourself is by backstabbing special monsters or doing triples. So you're forced to actually do, do triples in order to keep yourself uh, at top health. Uh, this also changes a lot how you play the game because uh, you need to be strategic about how, how, how the order in which you're going to do things. So again, we didn't have to implement a whole new mechanic, whole new world and stuff. We'd, it's the same thing, only with this slight change of how things work, 
you know, I, I expand the size of the game and, and the stuff that you can explore. There's also another secret that I haven't shown you guys. Uh, let me show it to you just real quick. Uh, I really like spoiling surprises, sorry. Um, there's, a, there's a level. Uh, wait. Come on. There's a level here that, that for people observant, they're going to notice there's something going on there, right? There's, there's, a, there's a smoky thing. If you get a bomb, you can bomb it away, and there's a candle. When you step on it, it opens a portal. And if you go through it, you go to hot dog level. Yeah. And the hot dog level has a very uh, interesting thing uh, that if you grab all of them, you turn into the chubby Fidel, which uh, only gets, uh, you can only buy hot dogs. You have no shop, you have no bomb, it makes the game quite challenging. Uh, so this is hot dog Fidel. Uh, and later on, if you get to the second transition, uh, if you get to the dragon, maybe you realize that there's also a portal thing going on there. I'm barking at them because they actually hurt you. So. If you come here, you get the chess level, which is actually, you need to, the pieces move like chess, so you need to get the pieces without being killed, which uh, sometimes is tricky. And you get the king up there to get to zero health. Okay, this one is easy. Um, yeah, so those were surprises. Anyway, so it's mostly, mostly, I wanted to show you a couple of surprises and stuff that we did to make the game a bit bigger. Um, we're getting to the end. Um, well, and the sole problem is that people forget, players forget about the shop. The shop is this thing down there. Using the shop is super huge, massively important for the game. And I took some, we took some steps to make it evident that you can use it, but we never actually figure out the right solution to get people to not forget about using the shop. We have, uh, uh, we did the thing where we, you know, uh, just have arrows and stuff. Well, it's not going to show up because we beat the game, but uh, let me reset the save game. Um, so we did this thing where, where, you know, there's a small bumpy arrow there, but it's, I'm going to be honest with you, it's pretty much useless, it doesn't do anything. Uh, people forget about it anyway. So people don't realize the shop is there when they st once they stop and start wondering what to do next, and some people realize it's there, but people keep forgetting about it. This is a problem with, that we never found the right solution for it. Um, then, uh, then regrets. I have two regrets about this game, about design of Fidel. One of the things I regret is not having a tutorial world by itself, like a small world at the beginning of the game that, uh, uh, that you know, you play just to figure out the basics of how to move, you move around and stuff. And maybe instead of doing the stupid hints that nobody reads, I could have, you know, have some text there, like this is what you want, like this is what it is, this is re rewinding and that's it. Uh, but I was, you know, I was, I insisted not having any text telling you what to do in the game. Uh, but maybe I overdid it a bit. And also having a tutorial world, it would have been good for the game. People keep telling me that they want to show the game to somebody else, but you know, you, they want them to play the tutorial, not the version they're playing where they have unlock all the monsters and stuff. Uh, having a tutorial world would have been nice so people can you know, show the game to some other people so realize how to play it. Um, And this one, uh, this is the last thing. This is one of the things that are unsolved in, in my heart is an unsolved problem. Uh, at this point, I, have, this is, uh, I finished Fidel. It's pretty much done. I'm not going to keep working on it except you know, to fix bugs and stuff. Uh, but there's, there's one thing that I wish I chose, and this is, was the hidden principle that I told you about at the beginning of the talk where I said that there was a principle I never actually quite 
adopted that I wish I did. And it's where I was making a, you know, a hardcore hard game that is a dangerous corner of the world and, and was not uh, uh, with no compromises, uh, with no trade-offs in which I say, well, this is a hard game. It's a hard, there's a, there's a ghost that chases you and kills you. Uh, that's the way it is. You can, if you are good at the game, the ghost doesn't matter. So that's how it is. Uh, which was more like in the spirit of how the game started. I mean, the first versions of Fidel are brutal, really brutal. Uh, and, as I, and as I time went by, I started, you know, it's just getting a bit softer. And I kind of slid into what I call the, the design of the times, which is uh, like in every age, uh, there's, there are design principles that are accepted as good practices of game design or how, or how to present the games or on how you treat your players. Uh, um, and what, what is considered a good design or a bad design. So e every age has a bit of that. Like uh, nowadays, if you grab a mobile game, like an iOS game and stuff, a free-to-play mobile game, you can quite see what the rules are, right? You need to be very nice to your players. You need to have a tutorial that doesn't make them feel lost. You need to have a slow ramp up of difficulty, uh, maybe a bit of minimalism and stuff like that. And old games tend to look or feel like each other, right? On mobile. That's what I call the, you know, this, this says the, 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 the spirit of how games are designed at a certain point. So when Fidel started, it was a hardcore, I don't care, right? I don't care about that, about that. I mean, I'm a hard game, that's, that's how it is. Like, suck it up or go away, yeah, right? Go, go play a mobile game. Uh, <laughs> and as, as time went on, I started, you know, sliding back into, you know, accepting some of the design of the times thing, where, you know, it become more tutorially, the game become more tutorially, uh, a, a, a bit less aggressive, and in fact, the iOS version of the game, which we shipped a couple of weeks ago, uh, doesn't have the timer in it. It does not have a timer. It lets you, I, I gave up on the idea that you need to be pushed forward, especially in a phone where you have, you only use one quarter of your brain. Uh, so I decided to remove that. So I've been, you know, just shaking off some things that were in the spirit of the first version of the game. So it feels like the, the Fidel that we have now is different from the Fidel we have two years ago from the one that we started making. I wish I made this a conscious decision. This is a thing I realized only recently. Uh, I wish I made a con conscious decision about this. Either I, it's a hardcore game, which, which would have removed a lot of, a lot of anxiety where, where I was feeling that maybe I can do better with the tutorial so more people play it, more, more people like it, or, or, or more people understand it, or, or at least I don't get so many people barking at me because they get killed by ghosts, right? Uh, or if you wait for this softcore, well, this is sort of a casually game that you can play sleepwalking, would have uh, uh, drawn me to do a simpler design. Maybe some of the choices of the design I made, I would have made simpler decisions. So if I, if I made a conscious choice, I would have, you know, have a less troubled time with design. Uh, unfortunately, if you ask me what I should have done, which two I should have picked, I still don't know. And that's why I didn't make the choice before. Uh, so the game is what it is, and I'm probably uh, going to know if we made the right choice or no in a while once, you know, the, all the designer hat has worn off, and then I can look at the game with maybe player size. So anyway, this is just a bunch of stuff I wanted to tell you about Fidel, and that's, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so is this on? Do these work? Hello, hello. Can we be heard? Is it all right? Good. Good hello, 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 hello. Hello. Can you hear um, me? Yeah, that was that was incredible. I love talks like that where you step by step go through the, sort of the problem solving aspects of of game design. We so seldom see this kind of like really deep dive into that process. So it was really really amazing.
Um, I want to ask you maybe a, just a couple of questions, and, and we don't have that much time for, for Q&A, so I'll ask you one or two questions, then we'll open it up to the audience, get a couple of questions from you all. Um, I, uh, I want to know about, so you're from Argentina, mm -hmm. and I'm always interested in the ways that the place on earth where someone is from ends up being an influence on the work that they create. So do you think of the, are there any traditions of, of Argentinian art and culture that, uh, that you think are reflected in your work? Um, are there any influences in, I don't know, Astor Piazzolla or Jorge Luis Borges or any other famous Argentinian artists that, that you find um, sympathetic to the way you approach how you work as a game designer? All right, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question, Frank. Uh, the answer is a bit sad, though. Uh, I would say that if my, if my work had the influence of Borges or, or Piazzolla, it would be alien to you. And one thing that happens that is very sad, it happens all in all of South America, is that you know games, video games in particular, are an American thing. They're just American all around. Uh, the ideas came from here. Uh, the industry is pretty much here. Uh, and the heart of the thinkers of the industry, this industry are here as well. Which uh, had a, a, a kind of a weird impact on the, has a, a very weird impact on the rest of the world, especially on uh, uh, third world. Uh, where we kind of look up at, uh, uh, you know, at the stuff that we like. I mean, we grew up, I grew up uh, with pretty much American games and American movies, mostly. There are some influence from Argentinian movies. For example, we have a very strong uh, cinema industry there. But as for video games, our frame of mind is here, which uh, is not actually how things are, how people think here, because we're there, right? So we have this weird, distorted, second-hand uh, uh, notion of culture of video games, right? So it's our interpretation of how video games, video games work, uh, which um, makes it very hard for us to say, okay, where I'm going to, I feel inspired, or I feel I have this idea has a lot to do with my culture, my local culture, not so much with the general video game culture, and the. The main problem that we have is that we don't make games for our people mm. in general. Mm. We make games for the world, which uh, restricts a lot of how our brains actually work. Mm -hmm. One thing I tell everybody is that, you know, I, I, I'm speaking English with you guys right now, uh, but, you know, I speak Spanish regularly. <laughs> uh, and when I'm speaking in English to you, my, my brain has a switch, right? So I switch to English. My brain thinks in English. It's not thinking in Spanish and translating. That doesn't happen. Yeah. It's impossible. In fact, if you see me talking to somebody in Spanish and you talk to me in English, I may reply to you in Spanish because I was with the city. You didn't give me enough time to switch, right? <laughs> yeah. um, there's, I mean, there's no such thing as uh, having both trains of thought at the same time. And something similar happens with video games mm. and, and the video game and how we think about video games. We are all with the American style video game brain thinking about our own work, right? Uh, all the critique I get is from people from here, mostly. Mm. Like everything that happened in my life as a game designer from Argentina has happened here. Mm. So yeah, it's very hard for us to make games for ourselves, yeah. uh, which means that my influences are maybe a bit subtle in, all ca in, in, in any case, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I'm hoping though, I'm hoping though that one day I will get to relax that and start making games for my own people, yeah. and then you will like them, uh, yeah. Frank. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I will. Um, you, uh, like I said at the beginning, I, I think of Fidel as being a, like a wonderful object lesson in game design, problem solving, and uh, the kind of game you can turn to to like um, draw inspiration for how to solve problems you're facing in your own work. Uh, what are some inspirations for you? Are there other games or other designers? that you turn to as examples of how to tackle some design problems? Well, I, I kind of, what happened is, I mean, who, who here has played The Witness? All right, so anybody who has played The Witness pretty much can see that Fidel has a strong 
is very influenced by the weddings, right? And in, in fact, Fidel was born at a, me, I was uh, helping John or, you know, hanging around John when he was designing the witness. So I have full notebooks full of witness puzzles. In fact, one of the puzzles in the witness is mine. Oh. Uh, the good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they want people to understand. <laughs> um, so he, uh, and his way of thinking about things is, is a big influence on me. In fact, uh, Bennett thought he, where's Bennett? Here, there. Uh, one feedback that Bennett gave me uh, one year uh, when I submitted the Ernesto to, uh, to the IGF was, uh, I wish you were less like John and Paul. Mm. You know, Bennett. Mm. Um, so, but he's been quite, yeah, quite the influence. I, 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 hung, I hang around him a lot when he was designing. I was really, really trying to get how he thinks about the games. Uh, so there's a strong influence there, mm. but at the same time, it's starting to move out mm. from that uh, from that, that sphere of thought, if you want. Yeah. Uh, but de definitely, I think both you, both you and I and Bennett and and, and a lot of you know people that I I, I know from uh, GDC, I, I was I, I was telling Bennett today that I feel like we are uh, kind of like video game sommeliers, mm. right? We look for the specific thing, delicate thing that we can find in games. And that's sort of making games for that people, mm -hmm. right? I'm not making games for the people that are going to buy my game. <laughs> I'm making games for Frank. <laughs> so I, I, I say that I'm happy that Frank, I, I'm happy that you like the game because yeah. I made it for you that's and I made no idea. money. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, um, so you guys are an influence on my work directly because uh, you, know, you are my community, mm. right? Uh, not, not the people actually playing the game. Not people on Steam and you know the gamers and stuff. Mm. Uh, and I'm trying to move away a bit from that as well. Uh, um, it feels a bit. It feels a bit like like uh, I don't know the English word for it. It's like um, you are uh, uh, in an ivory tower, mm. kind of thought, like exclusive, snobbish mm -hmm. kind of club. Right? Oh uh, yeah, oyster. Oyster is a good expression. Thank Cloister. You. Uh, so um, I'm trying to move out of that now. Uh, I think I have outgrown it a bit. Uh, so I want as a designer to start going different directions. Yeah. I, yeah, and of, of course, there's a lot of people I ad I admire, like Stephen Lavelle and stuff, that make these alien games or or or, or Lucas Pope making these alien games that are super weird and super themselves and stuff. I mean, kind of. I want that. I want to go there. Mm. Like I'm done with the. I mean, Fidel has been pretty much at this game design practice for. I mean, all the all the intro that you made about uh, you know me being in the art games movement. Then I you know walk up the stand and start showing this game, and people are going to what? The art games. What's arty about this game? And what's really going on is that uh, these games have been like game game design practice for me. It's, I want to be a very better game designer. Mm. So I'm going to push forward with these games, even though they are not maybe that artsy or groundbreaking or whatever. Mm. And now I, I think I'm done with that. I, okay. I want to go back to you know having a very, uh, a very clear vision of where I want to go. Yeah. Excellent. Um, let's open it up and see if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, Naomi. Uh, yes. I thought about it. Uh, um, I never had a uh, good idea. So one, one of the things that got me locked up into the ghost was that we were already using it uh, um, you know, to prevent you from dying. That was a, the first version of it. So I thought I was so clever by using the same ghost as a timer that it sort of got locked up into that mechanic. But uh, um, I, I understand what you're suggesting about, you know, Maybe making it a bonus XP if you make it to the end of the level without dying or lying less or something like that, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a better uh, solution than the one we used. Uh, but in spirits, we felt like the, that the ghost was so important to the aesthetics of Fidel that it would we didn't want to part with it. It was, it was not... Uh, 
it was it was not a solution to a problem, the ghost. It was part of the game since the beginning, and that's why we couldn't get rid of it like you know as, as easily. In spirit. Yeah. yeah. In uh, spirit. Yes. Yeah. Right. Should I repeat the question? Or yeah, uh, if you can, uh, paraphrase the question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're asking uh, if we um, thought about mm, making the ghost being able to be disabled. Yeah. If we, had an, if we could add an option to disable the ghost. As a kind of accessibility. To accommodate players yeah, that exactly. really didn't want to deal with it. So actually, we didn't have to think about it. People would yell at us yeah. to include the option. Uh, and I, again, I sort of caved in, but not totally. Um, there is an option to remove the ghost in the game right now. Uh, you have to press Control Shift F3, and it goes away. Uh, only, <laughs> it's not documented, or you can see it anywhere. Uh, but people who were complaining got it, right? Yeah. Someone was like, I really, I really want to get the the ghost. And I was like, OK, here you go. Uh, we did think about including the menu to disable it, uh, and at the end, what it did with the iOS version is just, okay, there's no timer. The other one, I'm not going to remove it because it's part of the aesthetic of the game. I need there to be some tension. I, I want there to be some tension in the game. Uh, but I don't have a posture where, as the designers, we should allow people to modify the experience we're trying to make or not. Uh, it's been in discussion recently, uh, Tom Francis uh, with, um, um, what's the name of the, this, this game? Uh, heat, heat Signature? Yeah, Heat Signature. Yeah. Uh, he included an, uh, options in the menu to reduce the difficulty and stuff. And it got me thinking, and I'm like, I don't know yet if I want to uh, uh, you know, do the trade-off or not. Um, for Fidel, we kind of didn't want to you know, give the full option. Yeah, we did. I, we did sort of give it when you you know beat the regular game, you can get rid of the ghost by playing the speed run. But that's that's about it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, how do I imagine making games for, kind of reconcile the fact that uh, I want to m stop making games for Frank and... Uh, uh, but also you still hate the players. <laughs> I still want to challenge. Well, the thing is, um, it's more about having an internal compass of where uh, I want to go with a specific project because every project has its own principles, right? Uh, as I said, so maybe uh, I make a, uh, another art game and I decide that I'm not going to uh, accept any rules or any feedback or whatever. I'm going to say this is the spirit of the game and that's it. I'm, 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 I'm not going to reconcile anything. Or maybe I, get, uh, I make a game, another game like Fidel, in which you know there is a, a sort of a conversation happening with the players, right? So I, I choose it depending on the project. Like my next project is going to be story. Who here knows about storyteller? All right. Uh, yeah, we should we should have shown that for a second. I've probably run out you of time. You want to show it real quick? I, I I could show it real quick. Can we? Yeah. Do you have? Is it the? Yeah. Let's. Yeah, we're good now. 
pop pop the projector on. Yeah. S talk about storyteller. If we if we get the Hitachi so my, gods my to yeah, the Hitachi. <laughs> us, we'll show it. So um, the um, storyteller is my next project, and and it has a more clear vision of where it's going, uh, or the kind of thing that it wants to achieve, and it's completely different from Fidel. So the frame of mind that I'm going to use for that game is is not what I use for Fidel. Uh, when I was saying that you know Fidel was a learning experience, more than you know learning how to make a game about tracing a path and killing monsters and getting XP. I mean that's that's not the learning I was I meant. The learning I meant was to maybe grow confident of my ability to solve problems, design problems, and what my uh, strategies are. Uh, my personal strategies are to solve those problems, to understand myself better making games. Uh, but when I think about storytelling, it has nothing to do with, 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 with Fidel or the approach I'm going to have. Storyteller is going to be more of a mainstream kind of game, not even gamer. Um, it's, uh, I'm thinking about you know, regular people just you know, maybe playing the game on a tablet uh, or, or their phone. Um, more than you know, playing on Steam or whatever. We're going to ship the game on Steam, but it's not it's not the main the main target. So yeah, my my guide there would be very different. Uh, so uh, so this was a very long winded answer. Do you want? I mean, do you, do you have if you have a second and, and it yes. works? Could we just take a glimpse of yes the next project total? By the way, this is the last time I'm going to show this game in two years. You guys are going to be the last ones. I'm going to show it publicly. Yes. Uh, then we're going to the basement for two years to make it happen. Uh, so um, Storyteller is a game about building stories, about building a plot. The way it works is that you're giving a, a dramatic goal as you can see here, someone is heartbroken. That's something you you need to make a story that fulfills this goal. And you're giving these characters. And the characters have characteristics to them. Like in this case, he likes women, he's loyal, and he commits, can commit suicide, right? Eve likes men, she's not loyal. And there's a gravestone here. So the way it works is like a comic a strip. And so we, what you do is just you just drop characters and they react to each other according to their characteristics, right? So now they, they fell in love with each other. So I need to get someone to be heartbroken. Like if I put Adam here, I mean, they're just, you're just, just uh, hanging around. Yes, we're in love, yes, yes. Uh, but now I want to make a heartbreak. So one thing I could do is drop a tombstone there, right? Right. So the game infer that it must be Eve because he's the only character in the story. Uh, and now I have now I have fulfilled the goal, which is uh, making someone be heartbroken. But I could have, you know, done it this other way, either way. As long as you get to fulfill the goal, the game is fine with your solution. In this case, it's teaching you to uh, to kill characters. Maybe we keep this character. She shows up. She doesn't care because she's not in love with him. She never met him. Uh, and then she dies. Okay, let's do that. Uh, in this case, Aaron falls in love twice. Now, here we have a problem, which is that if we put here with Mina, he's going to reject her because he's loyal, right? So we need to get him to uh, uh, fall out of love before uh, he can fall in love again. So we can do is kill Eve. And, you know, he's just sad until he meets somebody else. Right now we have fulfilled this 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 goal. Uh, here, I mean, the game starts getting tricky as 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 you move on. In this case, I need to break two hearts. Adam needs to break two hearts. So maybe, I mean, we could we could break one heart if we kill him. Right, but that's just one heart. What do we do? How can we figure this out? So. One thing that we do, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm actually thinking, I forgot how to solve this. <laughs> uh, it's like the centipede. Yes. <laughs> a 
Nice, nice. As you can see, many things happen in this game. We will see a bit, a bit about that. Uh, um, yes. Want to see that? I mean, somebody here wants to. Oh, there's something that is very cool. Uh, this guy is very cool. Uh, uh, so yeah, you can uh, you can see a star here. You can you can try making it happen in two frames. I'm going to do it really quick because I want to show you the rest of the game. But uh, what happens if, I mean, he falls in love with Mia. Now, Eve falls in love with him and she gets jealous, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but she's also in love with him now. So what happens if I kill him now? Right? Now I can do it in two frames. Uh, let me show you what happens later. Well, you can have a su you can have su su suicides are fun, but uh, uh, let me see. This 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 one is, is interesting. Alan gives up his life to his lover again. So let me ask you a question here. Tell me, what would happen if I drop her here? Louder? Exactly. But now, you know, I mean, he can't see her, right? But he's heartbroken. So he can commit suicide out of heartbreak because uh, his, his lover died. And then he comes back as well. And then meet each other. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this, this was, uh, this, what happens if people drop a character after their death was a long-standing design problem in this game until we figured out, yeah, just put a ghost. Um, then uh, let me show you the captions. The captions are interesting as well. Uh, show you real quick. Uh, okay, stories can get quite long. And then uh, more characters I introduce. I mean, Maria only falls in love with heroes, king, and rich people. Uh, and then you, you have the captions which forces things to happen. Like in this case, maybe these, you know, are, are, are these two are lovers and time goes by. And then, you know, aging ends like a happy couple and, you know, pretty regular. But now what about age difference? Like one thing that happens is that these captions only influence what's in the frames themselves, not the rest, right? So if I do this, I mean, she's not going to be old because she came up, af came up afterwards. There. Died because of Fenol, and we got the age difference star. Uh, then, uh, I mean, more characters I introduce in case get quite complicated. I mean, there's villains. Villains can kill people. Uh, which is a small bar and can, they can steal as well. And you, and you use, you know, comic style stuff. I mean, in this case, Adam got rich, but if I do this, Tim actually stole the mine, right? Because he's a villain. So the game does inference about what's going on in the frames all the time. And then I introduce settings, which, you know, allows you to uh, do stuff like, like kidnapping people. Um, then, let me show, uh, well, there are heroes, of course. And then there's a character, well, there's, there are vampires as well. See, uh, if you, uh, uh, yeah, vampires are fun. You can do from it, they, they just, just dried up. <laughs> uh, you have to be careful with the vampires. Um, and also characters have information. They know, they, they know stuff that they witness and you can use captions to make them believe stuff that is not true if you want. I mean, there's lying in the game as well. Uh, when things get, get pretty sophisticated. Let me show one, one last thing and when we, we go back. Uh, one thing that is fun here is this character here is Konstantin. Is he, what, what he does is he watches the form that you use for the story. He cares about form, right? <laughs> so here Konstantin is angry at you because he's, he's seeing that even Adam has swapped compared to the last frame together. And he's saying this because here Adam is on the left and, and Eve is on the right, and now they're reversed, right? So if, if we swap them around, he's going to go away. And now it makes this story more readable, right? 
So he cares about readability of the story. So if you, if, if you swap characters together or do something or put characters that don't do anything and stuff like that, he gets angry and tells you to remove them. So there's a second layer of, of gameplay there. So this is the next two years of your life? Yes. Working on a storyteller? Yes. Amazing. We will have you back in two years yes. to launch it at the NYU Game Center. Yes. <laughs> Daniel Ben Mergi, thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Awesome. That was beautiful, man. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.